Hi, and welcome to the first of three parts in an interview series with Professor Akiko Iwasaki. We're going to cover the thorny subjects of viral persistence, vaccine injury, autoimmunity, and the latest state of the research and our understanding of the condition. In this, part one, it's all about viral persistence and how Professor Iwasaki's Paxlovid trial fits in. By the way, this was an interview series which I was sharing with Dr. Asad Khan, but due to a tech malfunction, we lost the original recording, so we had to re-record. Asad sends his apologies for not being able to be part of this re-record, and a huge thank you to Professor Iwasaki for sparing her precious time to go through it all again. Hope you find it interesting. So, hi Akiko. Thank you so much for joining me slash us again. Um, <laughs> My pleasure. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if we could start with um, a little overview of your professional history and how you uh, came to be involved in the subject of long COVID. So I'm trained in immunology. Um, I've had my lab for 23 years at Yale. Uh, we've been studying various different uh, viral infection models and looking at immune responses to various viruses, particularly those that enter through mucosal surfaces. And uh, based on those insights, we've been developing vaccine strategies and therapeutic strategies. We were hit with the COVID pandemic, uh, as everybody else was, and we quickly uh, shifted to analyzing uh, people with, um, with COVID uh, who were coming into the Yale New Haven Hospital. And we started looking at the acute phase of uh, infection and immune responses. But then in early, I mean, the summer of 2020, we started hearing from people who um, just aren't recovering from uh, the initial infection. And um, that's when I also started speaking to David Petrino, who, uh, as you and everybody knows, as, as a great uh, clinician at Mount Sinai School of Medicine, taking care of people with long COVID. So we decided to work together to try to understand the immunological um, underpinning of this disease. And that's sort of how we came to today. What surprised you the most in your sort of journey of, dis you know, discovery of, uh, of the pathology of long COVID and everything around the condition? Right. So what's surprising, I guess, is that, you know, this virus, even though it's called acute respiratory infection, uh, it's neither acute nor respiratory yeah. in that um, it, 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 the, the virus appears to linger in multiple organs that are not uh, necessarily confined to the respiratory tract, um, such as the intestinal tract um, and uh, potentially brain and other regions. And so uh, that's number one is that, you know, we, we need to kind of think differently about these respiratory viruses in that they can establish um, reservoirs in other tissues. Uh, second thing that's uh, surprising, I, I guess, was the heterogeneity in, in which the people respond to this virus. Some people have just a very short course of disease and they're completely recover, while others have this very debilitating um, course of disease, which um, people are still dealing with after three, three plus years of this infection. So. Um, the heterogeneity and the uh, sort of uh, there's a persistent nature of this virus is are are quite surprising. And speaking about sort of that persistent nature, you were recently recently an author on a on a paper that was published in Nature Immunology. Um, what do we need to do next to turn viral persistence from a theory into a fact? And mm -hmm. to what degree may, may there be nuances around that fact in terms of for some people, but not everybody? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and do yeah. we have a sense about which people are maybe more likely to be suffering from it than others yet? Or are we still working on that? Yeah, really great questions. I think that's very timely to be asking these questions because it has a huge implication on therapy. First of all, how do we determine if somebody has persistent infection? Uh, of course, there are really um, you know, amazing ways like PET scan or some you know, whole body <laughs> scanning methods that could be developed to try to understand you know, if you have a reservoir and if, uh, you know, where they are. Um, however, those are very time and labor um, intensive and you know, we can't apply that to hundreds of thousands of people. So another possible proxy for having persistent virus is the circulating protein from viruses, such as the spike protein or the nucleocapsid protein. 
Uh, and uh, there are technology like the Samoa assay that uh, David Walt's team is using to analyze the presence of these um, viral proteins in circulation. That you know may or may not capture the entirety of the reservoir because uh, if the reservoir is in a in a tissue that is not ex- not really readily accessible to circulation, um, you may miss people with those kinds of reservoirs. So I, I went to this Keystone meeting recently uh, on long COVID. And there, what I heard was that multiple people who are using this kind of uh, circulating protein to analyze patients is that, uh, yes, there are a subset of patients who have these circulating protein. However, there are also people who recovered from COVID who have these proteins. Um, and that's also consistent with a recent study by Tim Henrich's group, uh, where they used the PET scan to monitor activated T cell in people who have COVID months before. And the data, again, support that uh, people with long COVID, they do have um, a subset of these people do have activated T cell in various organs, but those who recovered also uh, appear to have these activated T cells in various organs. So currently, Having the signature of circulating protein, viral protein, um, is likely indicating that there is some viral reservoir or at least proteins there. But that is not enough to separate people with and without long COVID. Uh, So that's a very long way of saying (laughs) that there are ways to measure these things, but we don't really know how to interpret those data yet. So what might be the difference between the people who are suffering from long COVID symptoms who have got these circulating proteins and those who aren't? What is being switched on or off in the people who are suffering symptoms? What yeah. Do we have any theories about what might be starting that cascade that's, you know, yeah. causing the reaction? Exactly. So a viral protein on their own may or may not be pathogenic. Uh, it's likely the immune response against these proteins that... Uh, you know, cause chronic inflammation. So it may be antibody mediated, it may be T cells, it may be uh, some other mechanisms like the spike itself having some uh, toxicity. Um, so, So what it means is that we need to go beyond just measuring the viral antigens and seeing what T cells and B cells and macrophages and other immune cells are doing about this present proteins. And of course, it may not just be the proteins that's uh, presented to the immune system. It may be the viral RNA uh, that's still present, uh, that's also uh, stimulating the innate immune responses. So it may be the combination of these viral protein and viral RNA that stimulates adaptive and innate immune responses uh, that's unique in people with long COVID versus those without. And that's why uh, precisely we're doing this deep immune phenotyping in people who recover from COVID versus who uh, have long COVID. And and we are seeing some distinct differences there. So so what does that lead us to in terms of treatments? Do we, should we be looking at a two-pronged approach where we try and deal with whatever the viral presence might be and then also what the immune reactions are? And how do we separate out uh, trials to work out who should get treated with what type? I mean, this is, seems to be a, a bit of a minefield potentially to get consensus across the whole research establishment globally about <laughs> about what what we're looking at here and who should get what treatments and how we interpret the results. I mean, is there what's the, is is there widespread acknowledgement of this as an issue? And, and what's the thinking like at the moment yeah. amongst your peers and the people you've spoken to? Absolutely. So, um, if the viral antigen is triggering chronic immune inflammation, getting rid of the antigen is actually a good way to get rid of the source of the problem. So that's why we and others are now um, engaging in this um, Paxlovid uh, trial. Uh, There, what we're hoping to do is to monitor immune responses in long COVID patients before and after the Paxlovid trial to see who benefited from the antivirals such as Paxlovid and what were their immune signatures Um, As I mentioned, the spike protein themselves may or may not be sufficient to distinguish people, right, with with and without long COVID. So is it spike plus X, Y, and Z? 
So the X, Y, and Z may be indicative of the immune response that I spoke of. Uh, it may be the antibody, maybe cytokines from T cells, whatever it may be. But without us having to guess this, we will be able to monitor uh, from this trial, you know, patients who um, respond positively to Paxlovid and try to get uh, a sort of a experimentally what the features we should be looking for in potential future responders. So this means that even though our trial is only 100 people, uh, if we can somehow manage to get that signature, we could in the future recruit people with those signatures for a larger trial. And our prediction is that those people would benefit better from Paxlovid than just general population with long COVID. Fascinating insight from Professor Iwasaki there, which might also explain why the anecdotal reports of Paxlovid amongst long haulers have been so mixed. In the next film, we're going to be discussing long COVID symptoms that develop after vaccination, how autoimmunity fits into the puzzle, and the best ways to go about treating it. A quick word if you weren't aware, if you're new to the channel and can't face watching all 105 videos I've made on the subject, you might find the Long Covid Handbook interesting. The link is in the description and have a look at the Amazon reviews to see if you think it might be helpful for you. I'd wager it will be. Look after yourselves, until next time.